Hello. Welcome to Historical. My name is David, and as always, I am joined by Jason and Michael. Hello. Oh, hey, y'all. And we here at Historical, we like to dig holes throughout history, take a funny look at random things. And today we have our shovels pointed at something that you may have heard of. What was that, David? It's La Cosa Nostra in the United States. Also. Uh, otherwise known as... The American Mafia. Ah, yes. Yeah. Or the <laughs> answer, that's, that's the one People might have been really confused for a second. Or the Italian-American Mafia. It's got several Yeah, names. you know, there's a few. So, anyway. Even though they're mostly Sicilian. Hey. Well, yeah, I mean, that's where they kind of originated. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into get, that. Yeah, obviously, we'll get into. Um, but, yeah. Uh, the Mafia. Who doesn't know the Mafia? And if you're not familiar with the Mafia, well... Go watch The Godfather. It's a crime organization. And yeah, go watch The Godfather. Or, good or numerous other things. Or lots of things. Yeah. There's plenty of stuff out there. Documentaries. Things that tell you all about it. It's an interesting topic. Uh, which is why I picked it. <laughs> we here try to pick interesting topics to dig. And yeah, not so much. So the... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so Cosa Nostra, which is what they called it within the organization, hey. translates in Italian to our thing. This is ours. Yeah. Um, and the organization eventually encompassed or absorbed other Italian American gangsters and Italian crime groups living in the United States and Canada that were not of Sicilian origin. Canadian mafia. It is often colloquially ill. Jeez, colloquially yeah. referred to as the Italian mafia or the Italian mob. Though these terms may also apply to uh, the separate yet related Sicilian mafia or other crime groups in Italy. So just keep that in mind. They're mostly uh, Italian. Like these terms get thrown around. Sounds like, you know, if people are talking about like they say the Sicilian mafia that, you know, they could be talking about the mafia in Sicily or the Sicilians that immigrated to the United States and then started their criminal enterprise here. <laughs> but there's notorious Canadian mobsters though. Yeah. Canadian mobsters, famous ones. I mean, the sure hey. uh, Canada's yeah. <laughs> we're sorry about, hey. <laughs> we're sorry, but we're going to have to take that payment now. Hey, <laughs> yeah, so it, it doesn't really like work. You haven't paid us for your, Services. What is that? I am now Irish Canadian. <laughs> I can't do voices. Well, you got that, the voice. I man. guess they have a Minnesota accent, right? <laughs> yeah, or something, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Oh something. yeah, oh yeah, Minnesota. I don't think they probably did, but let's say they did. <laughs> I mean, some Canadians probably far. Yeah, they kind of talk like. Anyway, we don't need to talk about this. Something about Canada. It's the history of Canada here. They're they're That's probably suck. <laughs> yeah. Next, stay you know, tuned. Wonderful. Uh, History of Canada. <laughs> so the mafia in the United States emerged in impoverished Italian immigrant neighborhoods or ghettos in New York's East Harlem, the Lower East Side, and Brooklyn. Ain't no lie. It also emerged in other areas of the East Coast of the United States and several other major metropolitan areas such as New Orleans and Chicago, which, if you listened last week, we covered Chicago or last episode. Who knows? Chicago. <laughs> uh, during the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Following waves of Italian immigration, especially from Sicily and other regions of southern Italy. Literally waves. Um, you know, obviously, that's what kind of uh, fostered all of this to happen. Um, it has roots in the Sicilian Mafia, but is a separate organization in the United States. Uh, other Italian criminal groups in the U.S., as well as independent Italian-American criminals, eventually merged with the Sicilian Mafiosi to create the modern pan-Italian Mafia in North America. They liked pans. He used to make pizza. It's a union. Pan, it's stretched across the entire <laughs> the biggest pizza pan Italian <laughs> Italian pan pizza. All right, the, the most important unit of the American mafia is that of the family. Um, as the various criminal organizations, uh, that massacred my boy, yeah. So, like, most of, yeah, they, typically they call it the family, like when you're t referring to yeah. the organization, the godfather, the family, the family. And we'll get into the structure of the family in a little bit, but uh, we'll move. We're just going to clear up some of the origins here of like where it kind of popped up. This Mafia, is the, the origin origins. story. Actually, before we get to that, we're going to talk about current what Mafia is currently most. <laughs> Jk, they're currently most active in the northeastern United States, with the heaviest activity in New York, New York City. <laughs> Who would have thunk? And with a su substantial presence in Philadelphia, New Jersey, Buffalo, and New England, in such areas as Boston, Providence, and Hartford. They just love cold hey, weather. Hey, Buffalo. 
they love accents and being wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they yeah, You can't be Southern mafia. He's some kind of wise guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gold chains don't really pass down here in the South. Well, now I see I don't know y'all now. That. It's no money here now. You see, we're the Southern mafia. I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, you talk about like chains, like these motherfuckers wore watches and like rings. They were the, chains. I'm sure they were, but they weren't like they didn't have pocket shit. watches. They didn't have that shit like hanging out everywhere. They really what they showed off their wealth with the watches. I think that's the thing is that you, you see those watches and they just take them off and like give them to some like bellhop and be like, yeah, go, hey kid, <laughs> go make something of yourself. I got ten more at home. Hey, give me an extra drink. <laughs> bring me some girls. <laughs> yeah, bring me a mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kids like all right. Go get some milk for you. For that, that watch, you see yes, that watch? Sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's usually what they do. You're a uh, good gopher, boy. <laughs> just put it in his pocket. He just puts it on his hand. At the Mafia's peak, there were at least 26 cities around the United States with Cosa Nostra families and many more offshoots and associates in other cities. That's a lot. So, the five main New York City Mafia families uh, were the Gambino family, the Lucchese family, the Genovese family, the Bonanno family, and the Colombo family. Ranked in order of how much we like them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, at, its peak, the Ameri- at its peak, the American mafia dominated organized crime in the United States. Each crime family has its own territory, except for the five families, and operates independently while nationwide coordination is overseen by the commission. So do the five families just have territory all over the place well no it's the, the fact that they're because that which i was about to get into the commission which consists of the bosses of each of the strongest families the five families were on the commission they had free reign over anywhere everything yeah they were in charge so it's like if the they came into your city one of the five it's their city. associates of the five families come into this your, is awesome yeah exactly now. it's like what they say goes they they have it's like in the military they have like a rank that supersedes the uh Say if they went to like Philly or Chicago, although, you know, that obviously needs to get solidified because as we can see, like it didn't quite coalesce immediately. There's a lot of fighting amongst crime groups, but Ooh, that family, you know, uh, Capone was part of that uh, whole process, too. And Prohibition, obviously, that whole era. We yeah, covered. go listen to those episodes. Uh, we'll touch on that a little bit here as we go through the history. But uh, uh, but so anyway, yeah, today's most of mafia's activities are contained to the northeastern United States and Chicago, where they continue to dominate organized crime, despite the increasing numbers of other crime groups. So they have competition right now. The free market, <laughs> uh, you know, the free gov- market of crime, the government came in and busted up the mafia monopoly on criminal enterprise and allowed other criminal enterprises yeah. to compete <laughs> in you the criminal share underworld. This, you got to share this bank ramen, see? It's just like, we, we, we yeah, it's like. We don't care that you're extorting people, but you got to share the extortion. Yeah, share you got to compete for that extortion amongst yourself. This is America. <laughs> yeah, we have competition here in America. All right. So the first published account of what became the mafia in the United States dates to the spring of 1969. Oh yeah, 1969. Excuse me, 1869. I was about to say. I was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Summer of love. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the mafia came the out mafia, of the hippies. Yeah, the mafia showed up. Goes in our hippie. Landed on the shores. Uh, the, New or- <laughs> <laughs> the New Orleans Times reported that the city's second district had become overrun by well-known and notorious Sicilian murderers, counterfeiters, and burglars who, in the last month. Burglars. have formed a sort of general co-partnership or stock company for the plunder and disturbance of the city. It's like a mafia alliance. It's the old Roman style. Yeah. Well, it was the whole thing where they were all like, you know, raping and pillaging. <laughs> and they all, but with Tommy guns. And then they all kind of like were looked at each other like, why don't we all just kind of get together? Why don't we rape and pillage together? You know, we can get a lot more raping and pillaging done if we organize. They all high five. We're all sort of related. We came from the same place. so We're all family. Yeah, and so, like, I mean, as is, you know, throughout human history, that's been the way it is, so. Naturally. You're kind of from the same piece of dirt I'm, I'm from. Let's all kill each other together. Immigration from people. immigration from southern Italy to the Americas was, primar- uh, was primarily to Brazil and Argentina, and New Orleans uh, had a heavy volume of port traffic to and from both of those locales. Interesting. The big easy. So that's Why does part- everyone always want to go to Argentina? Because it's easy to get to, I guess. Easier than some places. It's where you go to hide from your war crimes. Yeah. <laughs> That's why everyone who wants to We hear at Historical Hole don't like Nazis that hide in Argentina. <laughs> yeah. A mafia group. Hot take. 
Uh, mafia groups in the United States first became influential in the New York City area, gradually progressing from small neighborhood operations in poor Italian ghettos to citywide and eventually national organizations. The Black Hand was a name given to an extortion method used Ooh. in Italian neighborhoods at the turn of the 20th century, not to be confused with the Serbian uh, <laughs> um, terrorist, organization. terrorist organization. Yes, thank you. Or like some guy from a video game. Pretty sure there's got to be a guy called the Black Hand. Or the sexual move. So the term is sometimes mistaken for the mafia itself, which it is not. The Black Hand... You idiots. Uh, the Black Hand was a criminal society, but there were many small Black Hand gangs. <laughs> black Hand extortion was often wrongly viewed as the activity of a single organization because Black Hand criminals in Italian communities throughout the United States used the same method. So it just did the same thing. So everybody oh. thought it was like, oh... They're all together. Like, it's the one... Everyone was probably dressed the same, too. Like, didn't all the mobsters have those long overcoats and the hats? Probably hard to tell who was who. I mean, yeah, when the first started, you know, who knows what the fashion was when this first started happening. Oh, I know. It was But there was, these were poor Italian ghettos and stuff, so oftentimes these guys wouldn't be, like, too, too well off, especially the street-level guys. Lots of suspenders. I was about to say, I was like, a lot of suspenders, overalls. So, Giuseppe Morello was the first known <laughs> mafia... Giuseppe. Giuseppe. Yes, he's Italian. Uh, he's the first known mafia member to immigrate to the United States. He and six other Sicilians fled to New York after murdering 11 wealthy landowners and the <laughs> chancellor and a vice chancellor of a Sicilian province. So they murdered them and then left? They murdered the government and then left. So they didn't just take over the land after they killed all the landowners? Guess not. <laughs> and, well, because they killed the leader of the... They just killed everybody. Land. Yeah. Yeah. Killed the landowners and anybody that would care about the landowners. <laughs> like, I guess there's somebody else that cared about the landowners. That's why they Yeah, fled. you can have this land. It's like when they, they're giving the kid the watch. Like, yeah, there you go. I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah, you just give the kid the keys to the place. It's like, hey, we gotta run. Yeah, here's here's like, some land. Make something of yourself. <laughs> watch it till we get back. Here's a picket. Um, Dig so, some crops. <laughs> uh, so he was arrested in New Orleans in uh, 1881 and was extradited back to Italy. Um, Bummer. So New Orleans was also the site of the first possible mafia incident in the United States that received both national and international attention. The mafia incident's a great band. On October 15th, 19, or 1890, uh, I'm dyslexic today. <laughs> in 2,127. <laughs> yeah, in the year 3000. The space mafia. <laughs> uh, on October 15th, 1890, the New Orleans Police Superintendent David Hennessy was murdered execution style. Oh, it is still unclear whether Italian immigrants actually killed him or whether it was a frame up by nativists against the reviled underclass immigrants. Oh, God damn immigrants. Hundreds but of Sicilians were arrested on mostly baseless charges and 19 were eventually indicted for murder. How what is classified as execution style? I'm guessing like on it their knees, two to the back of the head, probably something like that. <laughs> they had a guillotine. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they got that elaborate and cut his head off. You know, they had an executioner, the guy with the black hood. Oh yeah, you've like, heard of the black hand. Oh uh, yeah, we're just, the black hoods. We just uh, execute people. Uh, an acquittal followed with rumors of bribed and intimidated witnesses. On March fourteenth, eighteen ninety one, the outraged citizens of New Orleans organized a lynch mob after the acquittal and proceeded to kill eleven of the nineteen defendants. Two were hanged. Nine were shot, and the remaining eight escaped. A successful lynch mob. Yeah, vigilante justice right there. I don't, you know, who knows what was going on. That sounds like just like a shit show right there. Like New Orleans, it's like it was a crazy, crazy place. Very it's still crazy. Yeah, they've retained that. No. There's no lynch mobs as much. Luckily, yeah, they've cut back on the lynch mob. Just more jambalaya. <laughs> <laughs> more jambalaya, less lynch mob. <laughs> Welcome to New Orleans. <laughs> and more beignets. We built it under the water. Uh, so from the 1890s to 1920 in New York City, the Five Points Gang, founded by Paul Kelly, were very powerful in Little Italy of the Lower East Side. Kelly recruited some hu uh, hoodlums. <laughs> hooligans. <laughs> no. We're the hooligans. <laughs> the, the, yeah, not hooligans. They're hoodlums. We're the hoodlums. <laughs> who later became some of the most famous crime bosses of the uh, centuries, such as Johnny Torrio, Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, and Frankie Yale. Ah, oh, Charlie. Frankie Yale. Uh, on January 16th, 1919, Prohibition began in the United Ooh. States with the 18th Amendment 
uh, of the United States Constitution, making it illegal to manufacture, transport, or sell alcohol. We covered this. Um, despite these bans, there's still very high demand for it in the pub- public. This created an atmosphere that tolerated crime as a means to provide liquor to the public. Oh, this crime's okay. As Al Capone said, I'm a businessman. I'm giving the people what they need. Tolerate me. <laughs> um, not explicitly re- related to the mafia involvement, uh, the murder rate during the Prohibition era rose from <laughs> 6.8 per 100,000 individuals to 9.7 within the first three months. Without alcohol, we start shooting at each other. <laughs> And I started Um, blasting. It's really not that much. Half a million dollars in bonded whiskey was stolen from government warehouses. Probably more people that didn't die. Still getting shot. Bullets kind of sucked back then. You just died of disease. (laughs) (laughs) Just died of disease. Died of disease. It was great. Mafia was great. Tolerate them. Two thirds (laughs) of historical is drinking right now. In case anyone's curious. (laughs) We hate prohibition. Because we're talking about prohibition. And Anytime I'm it not going to talk about prohibition sober. Yeah. That shit's boring. <laughs> this all sucks. Got to be drunk. So criminal gangs and politicians saw this as an opportunity to make fortunes and began shipping large quantities of alcohol to U.S. cities. The majority of alcohol was imported from Canada, the Caribbean, and the American Midwest, where stills manufactured the illegal alcohol. A. Hey. What you got in that still there? So oh. as we know, this basically you know set up the entire uh, operation. Uh, we'll, we'll get back into that. Let me touch on this. In the early 1920s, fascist Benito Mussolini took control of Italy in waves of Italian immigrants fled to the United States. That fascist. Sicilian mafia members also fled to the United States as Mussolini cracked down on mafia activities in Italy. As a way to escape the poor lifestyle, some Italian immigrants chose to join the American mafia. It's funny because Mussolini was pretty much running his own mafia. The um, Mussolini mafia. I mean, governments are basically mafias. <laughs> Ooh, that was what I was implying. Hot take. They're just a legal mafia. Oh yeah, that's man. why they don't like the competition. That's right, man. You heard it here first. Hey, hey. All right, Fabrizio. <laughs> so the mafia took advantage of prohibition and began selling illegal alcohol. Profits from bootlegging far exceeded the traditional crime of protection, extortion, gambling, and prostitution. Like, God, they were making so much money. All the fun stuff. And they are just like, we don't, we don't have to extort people anymore. It's like, we just can We just alcohol. hand out money now because we're loaded. So prohibition allowed mafia families to make fortunes. As prohibition continued, fac- uh, victorious factions went on to dominate organized crime in their respective cities, setting up family a family structure in each city. The bootlegging industry organized members of these gangs before they were distinguished as today's known families. The new industry required members at all different employment levels, such as bosses, lawyers, truckers, and even members, to eliminate competitors through threat and force. Muscle. Gangs hijacked each other's alcohol shipments, forcing rivals to pay them for protection, to leave their operations alone. The armed guards, are, and also armed guards, and uh, almost inevitably accompany the carry vans uh, carrying the liquor, obviously. It's like, eventually, it's like, yeah, why am I going to pay you for protection? I'm just going to arm my guys to guard the shit. Um, anyway, so yeah, we covered that already. Uh, in yeah. the 1920s, Italian mafia families began waging wars for absolute control over lucrative bootlegging rackets. As the violence erupted, Italian, uh, Italians fought Irish and Jewish, uh, Jewish ethnic gangs for control of bootlegging in their respective territories. Uh, in New York City, Frankie Yell waged war with the Irish American white hand gang. So they're not black hand, they're white hand. Uh, in Chicago, Al Capone and his... <laughs> And his family massacred the North Side Gang, which we covered in the last episode. North Side. His Irish outfit. In New York City, uh, by the end of the 1920s, two factions of organized crime had emerged to fight for control of the criminal underworld. One led by Joe Masseria and the other by Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano. Uh, with Masseria's murder in 1931, Maranzano then divided the New York City into five families. Maranzano, the first leader of the American Mafia, established the Code of Conduct... <laughs> Uh, for the organization, set up the family divisions and structure and established procedures for resolving disputes. In an unprecedented move, Maranzano set himself up as boss of all bosses and required all families to pay tribute to him. He's the Jesus of the mafia. I guess. I don't know if that's an apt uh, comparison. King of kings, boss of bosses. So Jesus was like kind of like a... Forcing everybody okay. to follow him in in, in name, but like every, forcing everyone to pay tribute to him. I was like, that sounds more like uh, 
to culting a nurse. Present or myself something. as tribute. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, this, this Jesus was a mobster from Italy. So this new role was received negatively. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise. And Maranzana was murdered within six months on the, or- <laughs> on the orders of Charles I mean, Lucky Luciano. Luciano was a former Masseria underling who switched sides to Maranzano and orchestrated the killing of Masseria. <laughs> Great movie. <laughs> like, whoa. Uh, the killing of Masseria. So he just... And then killed Maranzano. And then killed Maranzano. Yeah, Maranzano. Got, <laughs> this guy just took it. He's like, this guy is a motherfucker. Every every wing he got <laughs> taken under. Every Call wing me. he got taken under, he clipped. Yep. I'm the wing clipper. Uh, and so, yeah. The American Mafia operates on a strict hierarchy. Or, so, now yeah, let's get into right now. We're getting hierarchy. Into, the, into the structure. Strict hierarchical. <laughs> is that how you say it? Hierarchical? Hierarchical. It's not hierarchical. 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 Hey, you guys. <laughs> Urkel's in the mafia. The American mafia <laughs> operates on a strict hierarchical structure. <laughs> we can speak. While similar to its Sicilian origins, the American mafia's modern organization structure was created by Salvatore Maranzano in 1931. Maranzano. All inducted members of the mafia are called made men. This Ooh. signifies that they are untouchable in the criminal underworld, and any harm brought to them will be met with retaliation. Just ask Joe Pesci. With the exception of associates, all mobsters are made official members of the crime family. Three high, the three highest possible positions uh, make up the administration. Below the administration, there are factions, each headed by a, a capo regime captain, which we talked. <laughs> and I got, I got this wrong. Yeah, consigliere is the guy who is second in command. And that's who Al Capone was. He wasn't a capo. It wasn't command to him. He was the right hand for Sorry, whoever. Oh, that's right. I was here for that episode. Yeah. <laughs> whatever I wrote. Um, <laughs> whatever happened. So, yeah. The captain leads crew of soldiers. They report to the administration, can be seen as equivalent to managers in a business. When, <laughs> a, when a boss makes a decision. They hated Karens. When a boss makes a decision, he rarely issues orders directly to the workers who would carry it out, but instead passes instructions down through the chain of command. This way, the higher levels of the organization are insulated from law enforcement attention if the lower level members who actually commit the crime should be captured or investigated. So they provide them plausible deniability there. Oh, yeah. So obviously at the top, you have the boss. The boss (laughs) is the head of the family, usually reigning as a dictator, sometimes called the Don or the Godfather. (laughs) I'm going to make him an awful he can't refuse. Uh, The boss receives a cut of every operation. Operations are taken on by every member of the family and of the region's occupying family. You broke my heart, Fredo. Depending on the family, the boss may be chosen by a vote from the capital regimes or the family. Underboss. (laughs) The underboss, usually appointed by the boss, is second in command of the family. Underboss. The underboss often runs the day-to-day responsibilities of the family and oversees most of the lucrative rackets. Usually gets a percentage of the family's income from the boss's cut. The underboss is usually the first in line to become the acting boss if the boss is imprisoned. Is also frequently seen as a logical successor. Consigliere. Uh, The consigliere is an advisor to the family, sometimes seen as the boss's right-hand man. He is used as a mediator of disputes and often acts as a representative or aid for the family in meetings with other families, rival criminal organizations, and important business associates. So, a secretary. This is like if you've seen The Godfather. This is who Robert, Robert Duvall. Duvall. Robert Duvall plays. And he's awesome. Thank you <clears throat> for like cutting, finishing my sentence. You're welcome. Robert Duvall. Duvall. I gotta get this. Yeah. Robert Duvall. I know. I thought you were going to say his real name. I mean, his character name. Who's real? It happened. So, the next... What uh, is his name in that movie? Don't quiz me right now. No, I'm, I'm just thinking. Of this. The Capo Regime. <laughs> Capo Regime, also Captain or Skipper. Hey, hey skipper. skipper. Hey, Skipper. Is in charge of a crew. Skipper. It's a crew. A group of soldiers who <laughs> report directly to him. To um, the skip. Each crew usually contains 10, 10 to tw- uh, 20 soldiers and many more associates. A Capo is appointed by the boss and reports to him or the underboss. <laughs> I like to think we would have been soldiers in the Soldier. Time. So it's next in line is a soldier or soldato in Italian. A soldier is a member of the family 
and traditionally can be a full Italian background, although today many families require men to be of only half Italian descent on their father's side. <laughs> very specific. Yeah, they've lowered restrictions. <laughs> very specific. Uh, once a member is made, he's untouchable, meaning permission from a soldier's boss must be given before he's murdered. And, and okay. so, so, like, yeah, if the soldier does something, like, uh, out of line. A murderable offense. The, uh, the underboss, say, of the other family, of the offen- offended family, will go to the, uh, the soldier's Can family. Can we please kill him? Uh, please, sir, may we kill this man? <laughs> <laughs> you were like Oliver Twist to turn into a mafia guy. <laughs> please, sir, may we have some murder? <laughs> <laughs> please, sir. May we have he some, has offended our family. He's we offended us. Guns. And he has, we ask for recompense. He has deeply with his life. offended us to the deepest of deepest. Deepest <laughs> <laughs> of deepest. Yeah. You broke my heart, Fredo. I was, I was trying to stress how deep the offense was. It's almost like you come broke to me the on the spaghetti. day of my daughter's wedding <laughs> and ask me to sp- kill a man. He broke the spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> That bastard. Murderable. <laughs> <laughs> Offense. He spit in the sauce. Can you believe this? Did you see how he was twisting it up in his spoon? The gravy. The meatballs were bland. <laughs> All right. Associate. <laughs> <laughs> coughing right into the mouth. <laughs> and Michael's dying. All right. Associate. An associate is not a member of the mafia, but works for the crime family Just nonetheless. Just an associate. He's associated with the family. Associates can include a wide range of people who work for the family. An associate can have a wide range of duties from virtually carrying out the same duties as a soldier to being simply an errand boy. This is where prospective mobsters con- or connected guys start out to prove their worth. Once a, family, uh, once a crime family is accepting new members, the best associates are evaluated and picked to become the best soldier. So let me ask you, uh, Joey, what brings you in here today? <laughs> Can I ask you some questions about your background? How do you see here you worked at Radio Shack? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so looking you, to collect balls. How do you season your meatballs, Joey? <laughs> Wrong answer. Murderable offense. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me about your grandma's cooking. <laughs> Spicy. That's Joey. Joe. I mean, Joe, come on. That's, a, that's an Italian name. It's a biblical name. Uh, though. Okay. You know, what, what's a better Italian name? Let's just think of a What's your stereotype? Marlon Tony, Brando. Tony. Tony. Come on. Yeah, Anthony. Yeah. Anthony. Anthony. Anthony, what brings you in here today? Or uh, just hey, Sonny, hey, Sonny boss, Corleone. I was just trying to see if I could get some more work. <laughs> oh, well, well, let me check. I might have something here for you. Oh, we got a spaghetti shop down the street. <laughs> they ain't paying. And we need that money. We need that spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't giving we us We need a, that sauce. We a need spaghetti that. tribute. A, a monthly spaghetti tribute. Go down there and see if you can get a couple pounds. Yeah, my mother needs a specific kind of noodles. <laughs> sure thing, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Here, keep a couple dollars. Here's a watch. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a watch. Go see what you can do. <laughs> Go make something of yourself. <laughs> you just open up your suit and there's just like watches. <laughs> Y'all want to buy a watch? <laughs> <laughs> After Prohibition ended in 1933, organized crime Woo-hoo. groups were confronted with an impasse and needed other ways to maintain the high profits they had acquired through the 1920s. We have reached an impasse. The smarter, the smarter of the organized crime groups expanded into other ventures such as unions, construction, sanitation, and drug trafficking. You got to adapt. Change with the times. <laughs> the mafia's adapted. <laughs> it's evolved. It's like, hey, since we ain't got control of the alcohol no more, let's get control over the shitters. And the spaghetti. <laughs> I guess and it's the not workers. the workers. I guess it's not the shitters. I think it's gonna control the trash cans. That's the, a, that's the a good shitters. <laughs> that's a good racket. Sanitation. I don't know. I thought they were doing and shitters. We'll build shit. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. The porta potties are ours. <laughs> a fleet. So on the other hand, the mo- those mafia families that neglected the need to change eventually lost their power and influence and were absorbed. Stubborn. <laughs> Literally absorbed. As an alternative to the previous uh, despotic mafia practice of naming a, a s- spot. Yeah, as if it's naming it's a single crazy. mafia. It's crazy. It's so crazy. Boss man, despot. Uh, mafia practice of naming a single mafia boss as boss of all bosses. Luciano set up the commission where the bosses of the most powerful families would have equal say and vote on important matters and solve disputes between families. I, I, my Italian accent keeps going in and out, so just bear with me. Italian. This group ruled over the National Crime Syndicate. They have a name and a Wikipedia page. Uh, and brought in an, an era of peace and prosperity. The NCS. An era of peace and prosperity for the American Mafia. 
By the mid-century, there were 26 official commission-sanctioned mafia crime families, each based in a different city, except for the five families, which were based in New York. Which, Always the five families. Each family, except for the five families. Each family operated independently from the others, and generally, the others had exclusive territory <laughs> they controlled. We randomly will become Italian in this episode. I just said that. Uh, as opposed to the older generation of must- mustache peats, murderable offense, such as Maranzano and Mazzaria, who usually worked only with fellow Italians, the young Turks led by Luciano, were more open to working with other groups, most notably the Jewish American crime syndicates, <laughs> to achieve greater profits. You, you almost turn into a Jewish American yeah, exactly. at the end there. It's like a Jewish Irish. You boy. almost turn into Bernie Sanders and, for half and, a second. And <laughs> and we working Jew- with a Jewish <laughs> American. Co- no, that's, no, that's that's Bernie Bernie You're an Italian Jewish man. I'm a Jew, I'm an Italian Jew. Yeah, you're in an, an, a, a Jewish Italian. 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 A one or the other. And you pick one, folks. The mafia thrived by following a strict set of rules. <laughs> Vote on Twitter. What is he? <laughs> so they had the code of silence. Ooh. Known as Omerta. Tommy oh. Shut Lips. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Tight Lips? Is that what it yeah. is? Tommy, Tommy Shut that. Lips. <laughs> shut your lips, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, keep some lips <laughs> shut. This is Tommy, Tommy Shut Lips. Tommy Shit Lips? No. Murderable <laughs> offense. <laughs> <laughs> He's an associate. Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Shut Lips. The shut your lips. Tommy's coming. The rise of uh, power that the mafia acquired during Prohibition would continue long after alcohol was made legal again. Criminal empires, which had expanded on bootleg money, would find other avenues to continue making these large sums. When alcohol ceased to be prohibited in 1933, the mafia diversified its money-making criminal activities to include both old and new illegal gambling operations, loan sharking, extortion, protection rackets, drug trafficking, drug trafficking, <laughs> fencing, and, and uh, labor racketeering through control of labor unions. God, the labor unions. Okay, I'm looking to diversify my portfolio. <laughs> diversify your mafia. Diversification is what we're looking at here, boss. Diversify your bonds. Boss, we got to diversify. Now, now what are you? <laughs> We can't we got to diversify. Bu- we, we can't just be busting heads out here. We got to diversify. Hey, we keep murdering everybody for murderable offenses. Maybe we should change for the murderable offenses. <laughs> and start giving them prostitutes. <laughs> yeah. Someone get some spaghetti. <laughs> gotta gotta have a full belly of spaghetti to think about this. Okay, so that, let's Joey. get a little bit into the labor union stuff. And this stupid. Coincidentally, unions. some of this was actually covered a little bit in uh, the. Irishman movie that came out recently by Scorsese. You heard of it? Martin Scorsese? Scorsese? He's a director. All right. So in the mid uh, mid 20th century, uh, the mafia was re- reputed to have infiltrated many labor unions in the United States, most notably the Teamsters and Inter- mm-hmm. International Longshoremen's Association. The, this allowed crime families to make inroads into very profitable, le- legitimate businesses such as construction, demolition, waste management, trucking, and in the waterfront and garment <laughs> the shitters. and the waterfront and garment industry. In addition, they could raid the unions, health and pension funds, extort businesses with threats of workers' strike, and participate in bid rigging. Uh, in New York City, most construction projects could not be performed without the five families' approval. Uh, in the port and loading dock industries, the mafia bribed union members to tip them off to valuable items being brought in. Mobsters would then steal these products and fence the stolen merchandise. Like, God, like these guys were just running amok. Like they were doing whatever they wanted. And then anybody like, asked questions, just paid them off. Like every muck status a construction run. project. Like wasn't the Empire State Building built around then? They'd be like, hey, yeah, you could build that. Spaghetti. <laughs> Spaghetti for five years. Five families <laughs> signed off that. on that. They're like, ooh, tallest building in the city. Oh, yeah. We the tallest building in the world. They were probably like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, tallest yeah. building in the world. Yeah, yeah. We got oh, the money. Oh, we we'll can be this. this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fuck it. Give yeah. us some spaghetti. Yeah. Oh, spaghetti dry? Okay. We ain't working. <laughs> spaghetti dry. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the mozzarella ma- has run dry. <laughs> you know, they just infiltrated everything here. It's like, insane. it's like, it's wild. Anything. Diversification. You, and so indeed. when people talk about workers unions, it's like, yeah, the core concept is, is, is good, but look at what happens. <laughs> As many things have a good idea. Things can get very corrupted. Um, we cover the, many things like that. It's like, hey, it's a good idea in theory. And then yeah. it, Instant corruption. And then it starts in murderable offenses. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's getting murdered. Um, <laughs> Everyone's getting murdered up here. 
So Meyer Lansky made inroads into the casino industry in Cuba during the 1930s while the mafia was already uh, involved in exporting Cuban sugar and rum. Ooh. He when, worked with uh, Luciano. Cuban casino industry is a great band. When his friend Fulgencio Batista. Ooh, Batista. Yeah, that's his last name. Was he big as shit? <laughs> became, uh, he became president of Cuba in 1952. Several mafia bosses were able to make legitimate investments in legalized casinos. We're going legitimate. One estimate of the number of casinos mobsters owned was no less than 19. However... When Batista was overthrown following the Cuban Revolution, his, his successor, Fidel Castro, banned U.S. investment in the country. Oh, Castro. Putting an end to the mafia's presence in Cuba. So when people want to ask about like Cuba and like the whole embargo, it's like, who started it? It's just like, uh... He did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fidel Castro. Yeah. We didn't start it. We just finished it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't even do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Las Vegas was That's true. Time finished it. <laughs> Time. Las Vegas was seen as an open city where any family can work. Once Nevada legalized gambling, mobsters were quick to take advantage of the casino industry. Uh, and the, and the, it became hugely popular. Since the 1940s, mafia families from uh, New York, Cleveland, Kansas City, Milwaukee, and Chicago had interest in Las the Vegas. The Milwaukee casinos. mob. They got loans from the Teamsters Pension Fund, a union they effectively controlled and used legitimate front men to build casinos. When the money came into the counting room, hired men skimmed cash before it was recorded, then delivered it to the respective bosses. This money went unrecorded, but its amount is estimated to be in hundreds of millions of dollars. God, these guys. Back then money. Man, these motherfuckers probably make like so much money. I mean, in today's money. Yeah. yeah. Like you know, inf- if you adjust for inflation. Billions. God. Hundreds of billions now. <laughs> uh, uh, but a lot. Probably. Uh, a lot. <clears throat> a billion's uh, a big number. Yeah, it is. Last time I checked. And you had like 19 different casinos? Is that what it said? No, that was that was Cuba. But still. It, yeah, it probably was more. But I'm sure they were building multiple casinos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, multiple families. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wild. Uh just to, you just what you, what you think about how long these operations went on for too like how and two you think about today how much money goes to Vegas in one day a lot all of it yeah my oh god boy. it's yeah, do you think billions oh yeah Probably possibly in a day? trillions depending on the season because you got to think about sports I would not say too. trillions on a day but you got to think about sports betting too on a day, I don't think. Just how much money? If you talk about how much money, money just changes also, hands. There you know? are. There's got to be like a lot. Twenty some casinos in Las Vegas, all operating. If they're all making a billion, of five hours. You said there's there's twenty. There's got to be more than twenty casinos in Vegas. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm just I'm lowballing it. You're just saying if twenty casinos in Vegas. Well, in the slow season. You've got to be changing money, though, but constantly. Like, say even like around this time of year. So anyway, the point is, Lots like, of you money. think about how much money goes in one day. These guys were doing it for On years. On penny slots. And they were just skimming off the... <sighs> yeah, you could literally just take a little bit off the top. And it was never recorded, never taxed. Nobody yeah. knew, even knew about it. Uh, and that's the, with gambling, you, because it's cash. You can, Las Vegas-style gambling. Sweet words. Untaxed. <laughs> Pure, unrefined. <laughs> untaxed. <laughs> untaxed. <laughs> mm. uh. So we we we've words. we've talked about how much the United States government loves their sweet sweet taxes, but there was ma- no war going on. And that mafia is just like, oh no, you don't get to have them taxes. <laughs> <laughs> like, we found we keep it at all for ourselves <laughs> for that spaghetti. Hey, yeah, the government <laughs> then put a spaghetti tax. <laughs> the sauce, the tax. spaghetti tax. <laughs> <laughs> the sauce is ours. <laughs> and then a war. <laughs> the meatball act. <laughs> <laughs> the meatball act of nineteen twelve. <laughs> We dumped all the spaghetti sauce into the harbor. <laughs> it was like the Boston <laughs> Tea Party, but with just sauce that someone had already made. See, the, that's the worst the part. The New York Spaghetti Party. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> the streets ran red with sauce. <laughs> so, operating in the shadows, the mafia faced little opposition from law enforcement. Local law enforcement agencies did not have the resources or knowledge to effectively combat organized crime committed by a secret society they were unaware existed. Many people within police forces and courts were simply bribed, while witness intimidation was also common. In 1951, a U.S. Senate committee called um, a hearing. I can't. I don't know how to pronounce that. uh, (laughs) What? 
Kefauver. I don't know. Kofavi. <laughs> Kofavi <laughs> hearing. Uh, the Kofaver hearings determined that a sinister criminal organization known as the Mafia operated in the nation. <gasps> Many suspected mobsters were subpoenaed for questioning, but few testified and none gave any meaningful information. In 1957, the New York State Police uncovered a meeting and arrested major figures from around the country in Appalachian, New York. The event dubbed the Appalachian Meeting. Uh, this forced the FBI to recognize organized crime as a serious problem in the United recognize. States. Recognize. And changed the way the law was enforced and investigated. In 1963, Joe Valachi became the first mafia member to turn state's evidence provided detailed information of its inner workings and secrets. More importantly, he revealed Mafia's existence to the law, which enabled the Federal Bureau of Investigation to begin an aggressive assault on the Mafia's national crime syndicate. So aggressive. Following Valachi's testimony, the Mafia could no longer operate completely in the shadows. The FBI put a lot more effort and resources into organized crime activities nationwide and created the Organized Crime Strike Force in various cities. <laughs> organized Crime Strike Force, go! Boom. However... Great movie. Spaghetti. <laughs> however, while all this created more pressure on the mafia, it did little to curb the criminal activities. Organized Crime Strike Force! <laughs> Success was made by bringing uh, the beginning of 1980s when the FBI was able to rid Las Vegas casinos of mafia control and made a determined effort to loosen the mafia's stronghold on labor unions. So, uh, when the Racketeer Influenced and Cr or Corrupt Organizations Act, otherwise known as RICO Act, became federal <laughs> law in 1970, it became a highly effective tool in prosecuting mobsters. It provided, uh, provides for extended criminal penalties for acts performed as part of an ongoing criminal organization. Uh, violations of the act is punishable by up, by up to 20 years in prison per, uh, per count and up to $25,000 in fines. And the violator must forfeit all properties attained while violating the RICO Act. The RICO Act is proven to be a very powerful weapon because it attacks the entire corrupt entity instead of individuals who can easily be replaced with the other organized crime members. Between 1981 and 1992, 23 bosses from around the country were convicted under the law, while between 1981 and 1988, 13 underbosses and 43 captains were convicted. Over 1,000 crime family figures were convicted by 1990. While this significantly crippled many mafia families around the country, the most powerful families continued to dominate crime in their territories, even if the new laws put more mobsters in jail and made it harder to operate. With Sammy Gravano agreeing to cooperate uh, with the FBI and turn state's evidence in 1991, he helped the FBI convict top mafia leaders in New York. Although not the first mafia member to testify against his peers, such a powerful mobster agreeing to do so set a precedent for waves of mobsters thereafter to break the code of silence uh, and do the same thing. Giving up information and testifying in exchange for immunity from prosecution for their crimes. Snitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Snitches get stitches. And a spaghetti. A si no, no spaghetti. No spaghetti. <laughs> oh, wait. No spaghetti for the snitch. You get spaghetti in hell. Aside from avoiding long prison stretches, the FBI could put mobsters uh, in the United States Federal Witness Protection Program, changing their identities and supporting them financially for life. This led to dozens of mobsters testifying and providing information during the 1990s, which led to the imprisonment of hundreds of mobsters. As a result, the mafia has seen a major decline in its power and influence in organized crime since the 1990s. So, yeah. That's kind of the story of the mob witness That's protection. That's the story of the mafia. Is that why they invented witness protection was because of the, the mafia? That would be an interesting question that I bet you David doesn't know. I mean, I imagine so. Like, why else would the, you need something like that? Unless these people were under threat from, like, a vast criminal enterprise. enterprise. The spaghetti party. Or, yeah. So, anyway, uh, in a little tidbit here, this is kind of our historic whole the hole <laughs> we dug in the wrong direction so here's another hole there's a plot to assassinate fidel castro ha. in an, all right so in august 1960, uh, 1960 colonel sheffield edwards director of the office of security of the central <laughs> intelligence say the office the office of security of the central intelligence agency the tv show otherwise known as the cia proposed the assassination of Cuban head of state Fidel Castro by mafia assassins. 
Between August 1960 and April 1961, the CIA, with the help of the mafia, pursued a series of plots to poison or shoot Castro. Those allegedly involved included Sam uh, Giancana, Carlos Marcelo, Marcelo. Santo Traficante, Traficante Jr., Jr., and John Rosselli. I wonder if it was the, the mobsters who came up with the, the exploding c- cigar. I know, right? Idea. Probably. That sounds like they blow cars up. But then like, again, like, CIA did come up with stuff cigar? like that. Like, what if we can make this explode? A pen? A cigar? But see, I think it's funny that they, bird. the CIA turns to the mob because obviously the mafia is good at murdering people. But then they also had beef with Castro for kicking him out. Because, because then they that's, had casinos done there. Exactly. They had interest. So the government was like, hey, what if we use the mobster's self-interest here to get what the we enemy want? enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the like mobsters think, were like, oh, yeah, if we get Castro out of there, we can open our casinos back up. I like to think that the CIA was just like, got all the the bosses and the, the underbosses in there. And they just were like, well, they proposed the plan. And they're like, well, what do we get in return? This pot of salt. Exactly. <laughs> they open up a giant vault and they just like turn the thing. <laughs> and it's just noodles and noodles. They <laughs> just come coming out. And there's more where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> there's one guy with a cigar in his mouth that just falls. Just drops <laughs> out in disbelief. Shock. And sauce? Oh, there'll be sauce. <laughs> <laughs> we may even throw in a few meatballs. <laughs> Season just like your mother likes them. <laughs> spicy. <laughs> oh my god, spicy a meatball. A spicy meatball. <laughs> oh, that's probably offensive. All but right. enough ragging on Italians. And then they didn't kill him. It's okay though, because I have an Italian friend. <laughs> yeah, his name is David. <laughs> He's right there. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm my own best friend. So yeah, this that's where we ran long this week, but we wanted to give you the full story. All the, the mafia. The mafia. Yeah, so that's Go listen to other week. stuff. We talk uh, about Al Capone and the Prohibition and all the other stuff. Uh, any other things to add before we just say goodbye? Um, I'm hungry for spaghetti. Uh, go check out our other podcast, Subjective Changes Podcast. We talk about movies and stuff. If you just like this, it's basically that. Or, I mean, it's basically this. <laughs> it's basically, that. that is that. This is this. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll probably talk about mafia movies now. Yeah. There's a good chance. Good chance. And that one, you can see our faces. In case you're curious how ugly we are. It's cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Oh. <laughs> the best mafia movie. The best, my favorite mafia movie. All right, anyway, guys. So thanks for listening. listening for this week. Follow us. Listen to all that shit. Yeah. <laughs> all that shit. All of it. All right. Take a hole. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>